My name is Francis Negro Montaner. Uh, welcome to the uh, series of Desendeudadas, the fourth and last installment organized by the working group at Columbia University Institute for Latin American Studies on Latin America, Debt and Education. Our, our general goal in the series has been to get to know uh, the work that's being done throughout the region in various key sites, uh, such as core questions, social movements, pedagogies, and the arts. And I would like to turn it to Miguel Ángel Blanco, the coordinator of the working group, to say a few things about the discussions that we've been having over the course of the last few weeks. Miguel. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this final installment of this exciting series, Tightening Depth from Critical, Pedagogical, and Activist Perspectives. So I'm Miguel Ángel Blanco, PhD student in Latin American and Iberian Cultures Department. And I've been coordinating the series uh, throughout this semester. And just to recap what we have been talking about uh, so far in the first previous encounters. In the first one, we, we began the series by uh, getting to know the contributions of feminist scholars and activists, Veronica Gago, Lucia Caballero, and Rocío Zambrana. And from Puerto Rico to Argentina, and in between of a number of feminist transnational alliances, this first encounter helped us to understand the colonial extensions of debt as a capture mechanism of feminized labor and subjectivities as a very specific generator of patriarchal violences that need to be demystified in their assumed abstraction, and also as a, an activist mobilizer claiming for feminist economies of disobedience. So from this premise, we, we continued uh, with the second encounter talking on uh, the counteractions of depth from education and pedagogies, both within and outside formal educational institutions and throughout the experiences and, and the research of scholars and educators, Stephanie Hueso, Jason Gosniak, and uh, Raquel Torres Arzola. In this second installment from El Salvador to Puerto Rico, and across the Americas, uh, we um, thought and rethought um, about the institutional perpetration of indebted student subjectivities, as well as the uh, depoliticizing character the institutions uh, develop when trying to uh, overturn them on account and onto student bodies. The increase in fees in the reaching of a formal education and the burdens for students to collectively organize against the student debt on campus because of the pandemic was contrasted in the second encounter with the dynamics and politicizing potential of popular education. So diverging while tackling the subjectivizing patterns of student debt, popular education uh, in the second encounter offered a number of methodologies to re-understand education as community building and also as co-learning and co-management when it comes to land, natural resources, and local production. And last week, this third encounter uh, continued talking and debating all these triggering and necessary conversations by placing um, the critical and, and the pedagogical into a context of activism of student debt movements across the United States and Chile. And we had the experience to listen from activist organizers uh, Ume Hope from the Deaf Collective and Juan Pablo Rojas from Deuda Educativa. So on the one hand, uh, Ume uh, detailed the mobilizing strategies enacted to achieve student debt cancellation in several US schools, as well as increasing awareness and commitment to pursue wider debt cancellation expressed by federal or national authorities. Moreover, Hope commented on debt uh, on debt collectives, different alliances with other social movements and situations of indebtedness. Likewise, from Chile, Juan Pablo Rojas contextualized the student debt in Chile, how Chilean governments have implemented indebting educational mechanisms to benefit neoliberalism in the country in detriment of public support of students, and how student movements across the nation are changing such an indebting scenario. Proof of Proof of this is Deuda Educativa, a nonprofit organization offering legal support and awareness to achieve student debt cancellation. Juan Pablo showed us the strategies of Deuda Educativa for public mobilization against debt in the country, as well as their impact during the so-called estallido, 
in late 2019. And today, we will resume the series by paying attention to arts and activist efforts to counteract death in Puerto Rico. Our panelists today are an author and poet, Mara Pastor, and a scholar and artist, and also co-chair of the series, Francis Negro Montaner. And to moderate our discussion, we come with the participation of scholar and writer, Max Hyven. Max Hyven is Canada Research Chair in Culture, Media, and Social Justice at Lakehead University. And he is the co-director of the Reimagining Value Action Lab and editor of Vagabonds, a series of short radical books from Pluto Press. And his most recent books are Art After Money, Money After Art, Creative Strategies Against Financialization and Revenge Capitalism, The Ghosts of Empire, The Demons of Capital, and The Settling of Unpayable Debts. So, Max, when you wish. The floor Thank is you here. so much. You're welcome. Uh, and, and it's lovely to be here uh, with all of you and with our uh, two very exciting speakers. Um, Miguel has already mentioned uh, who they are. So, I, what I'll do is I'll introduce them uh, each, uh, and then I'll introduce uh, Mara, and then ask Mara to speak, and then uh, introduce Francis and ask Francis to speak. Um, just uh, note that sadly and shamefully, I'm I'm simply an anglophone, so I have uh, I'm not going to be a great moderator if uh, folks do need to uh, or wish to speak in Spanish. But I believe there will be um, translation in the chat box, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so please watch the chat box and Miguel will, will be doing some uh, summarizing translation. And for those of you who are not here in the panelist room with us, um, uh, but who are in attendees of the event, if you would like me to relate a question from you to our panelists after both panelists have given their presentation, uh, please do type it in the Q&A section or the chat box and I'll keep, a, I'll keep an eye out there uh, for those and would be happy to pass them on. Uh, after both of our panelists speak. Um, so I will begin by introducing Mara and, and asking Mara to address us um, and share her wisdom. Uh, Mara Pastor is a Puerto Rican poet, editor, and scholar. Pastor is author of several collections of poetry, including uh, Deuda Natal, or Natal Debt, translated by Maria Jose Gimines and Anna Rosenwong, which was selected for the 2020 Ambrosio Prize and is forthcoming from the University of Arizona Press. She lives in the high mountains of Ponce, Puerto Rico, among flowers, mango, and achiote trees, coffee plantations, and a terrace overlooking the vast plains of the Caribbean Sea. She's an associate professor of Spanish at the Pontifical Catholic University of Puerto Rico and collaborates as a writer and editor with a number of publications and magazines in Puerto Rico and abroad. Thank you so much for joining us and let me know when you would like me to share the uh, images of the poems that you had sent along. Of course, gracias Max, gracias Frances for inviting me. And um, well, I was sent some questions. I um, started answer one of those questions and I think that I ended up uh, uh, talking about all the questions, um, but it's going to be brief and I still have um, more questions that answers about this topic. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, education, um, how violence and debt interrelated educational spaces and practices. And after that, I'm going to read some poems from my forthcoming book that um, it's about debt in a way. Um, and I think that I will be able to, to, um, to give you um, some uh, images and some experiences that have been related to debt uh, since I returned to Puerto Rico in 2016. Um, so now I'm going to read a little bit. Having debt is not having time. We don't give time to debt, but debt take it, takes it from us. Debt 
is to capitalism what sin is for Christianity. And if you are born in a colony, you are born with original debt. That is an unpronounceable debt. There is a lack of recognition from private institutions on how violent indebting young people is. The mentality of these institutions definitely impacts all the people that are part of their machinery. The students in private institutions in Puerto Rico right now, right now, my students, for example, have um, student loans, car loans, and a badly paid part-time job, if not a couple of full to the limit credit cards. They do have Pell Grant as well, but it's not enough. Not a penny from it goes to improve quality of life. In other cases, we have whole families sharing a car and sharing household in complicated, overcrowded apartments and unreliable private health, health services, treatment, supportive systems. That steals our time. I always tell them that in countries with universal education, as for example, Mexico or Germany, a student their age gets free tuition free transportation and even free allocation or that students pursuing grad school are paid to do so or paid to teach one undergrad in undergraduate class. They get very surprised and incredulous. In the other hand, educational institutions that in debt students also tend to exploit their employees with overcrowded courses, too many sections, and an excessive amount of teaching and administrative work. I wonder if the biggest the student debt or the, or the biggest the difficulties for the students to carry to pay them uh, are relatable to the conditions for professors and lecturers. Time is what is taken from us, perhaps as poet and editor Elena Medel said recently in an interview, we end up writing not the book we want, but the book we can write. And having all this said, I have chosen to live in this indebted colony to experience motherhood and many forms of labor here. How poetry intervene and raise awareness about debt. Poet and translator Ezekiel Seidenberg says that poetry is the opposite to publicity. Instead of selling you something you don't need, it gives you something you didn't know you wanted. Also, Derrida, in his famous book on debt, Giving Time, the Counterfeit Money, or Dar el Tiempo, la Moneda Falsa, quotes a letter by Madame Breton in which she says, the king takes all my time. I give the rest to Saint Seer, to whom I want to give everything. Poetry is the rest that I don't have. In the poetry, um, uh, is the poetry workshop I teach on Saturdays instead of resting when my daughter is with my when my daughter is with her his, her father or what I record on my cell phone while driving to daycare with my breast pumps in. Is the place I tell students is not expected, uh, that, is, that it, it, it doesn't expect anything from them, just crossing it to recalibrate their senses. So every space can allow us to think about debt. The problem is debt takes that time to think on it. It takes our time and we have to fight it doing art in whatever is left from it. Poetry is the decision to sneak up, to set invisible boundaries, to in invent new territories in order to find poetry at toda costa, at all cost. In the poems I'm going to read, I have thought about that in different ways. Um, the title of the book comes from a playful experiment with the book by Martinique and poet I Messeser, Notebook of the Return to the Native Land. So instead of returning to the native land, I have returned to the natal debt. So Max, if you can um, show the, um, the fragment. I uh, want to read this uh, fragment from the book because it's also um, something I, I'm going to play with in the next poem. 
It's a fragment from Notebook of a Return to the Native Land. And I'm going to read the second fragment that it starts in I Will. I will rediscover the secret of great communications and great combustions. I will say storm, I will say river, I will say tornado, I will say leaf, I will say tree. I will be drenched by all rains, mustn't by all dews. So I'm just going to read that fragment from, from the book uh, by I Messeser. And uh, can you go to the next poem, please? Um, this is the poem that gives um, the title to the book. So I'm going to read it in Spanish, but you can follow me in English there. Tormenta diré, río diré, tornado diré, hoja diré, árbol diré, mojada seré, humedecida seré, justo no seré, pelícano no seré, bebé querré, hombre querré, la canción del hombre querré, Mujer siempre seré, mujer pequeña tendré, isla pequeña tendré, dinero no tendré, sueño tendré, trabajo demasiado tendré, sal diré, papaya diré, habichuela y yuca diré, carro tendré, combustible tendré, lavadora tendré, qué caro todo diré, qué lindo todo diré, gatos tendré, pelo de gato tendré, madre y padre tendré, Madre seré, tía seré, esposa seré, amiga seré, poco tendré, casa alquilada tendré, deuda tendré, árbol diré, hoja diré, tornado diré, río diré, tormenta diré. So, um, that was Natal Deb. Can you go to the next one, please? And this one I wrote it, um, it was the, the, um, was some sort of celebration about Spanish language. Um, I don't know if it was because it was 500 of, of having the, the grammatic. Um, I don't remember exactly what was the occasion, but the king of the king of space, uh, <laughs> the king of space, the king of Spain came to Puerto Rico. And uh, when he was talking in the in the local television, he was giving his speech about Spanish language and uh, they misspelled uh, majestad, majesty. And then uh, in the cover of the newspapers, that was what was, you know, quoted like, like Puerto Rican, uh, uh, the, the one who was writing the, the, the captions uh, misspelled majestad Ma so i uh well um, this is not the poem can you go to the next one please is the next one this is uh yeah this and so i wrote um this poem after that um hay una deuda it's um has a quote from Jose Maria Lima, a Puerto Rican mathematician and poet um there's a song but it's broken and it's useless to say it in pieces Hay una deuda, pero está rota y es inútil pagarla en pedacitos. Hay un majestad, pero está mal escrito y es inútil decirlo rey. Hay un rey, pero está en pedacitos y es inútil decirlo en deuda. Hay una lengua, pero está en deuda y es inútil decirla. Cuando les dije espejismo, ellos no vieron nada porque nunca habían escuchado la palabra espejismo. 35 revoluciones frente a mí que murmuran y nunca habían dicho espejismo ni majestad con G. Habían visto molinos de viento que no funcionan en Santa Isabel de donde se fueron los gigantes con G y los galenos con G y los gobernantes con G y los galleno, gallegos con G. Pero tengo una deuda, está rota y es inútil pagarla. No tengo. Can you go next page, Max? Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis pelícanos, pero los debo. No tengo una, dos, tres niñas, pero las debo. No tengo una, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco islotes, pero los debo. Tengo un pedacito, pero está roto y no es inútil decirlo. So, um, and then, There's another poem um, that is called Alaska that I don't know if it's the next one. Yeah, it's the next one. And um, this one is um, many Puerto Ricans were 
hired by Alaskan companies after Huracan Maria to work packing fish in Alaska. And then we heard about <coughs> um, how these people were exploited. This is a part of Puerto Rican history that has repeated over, I don't know how many years of Puerto Rican, Puerto Ricans going as labor and having um, very bad conditions. Alaska. Lo que queda de mar se empaca en Alaska a costa de nuestra urticaria. Cuesta hablar en esta isla porque a cada bocanada de aire te entra un puñado de repelente. Llegan noticias de Alaska y no son poemas vanguardistas. El costo de un pasaje al estado 49 no tiene equivalente en palmeras. 49 palmeras no aseguran el saldo de la deuda natal. Este acertijo nos pica a todos. So, um, yeah, I'm going to stop here. I have some other poems. Um, but I think I'm, I'm, I, it would be good to open conversation later or to read some more poems if, if we have time at the end. Um, so, yeah, that was all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mara. It's, this is amazing work and um, reveals so many of the complex intersections around uh, debt uh, in such a in such an enlivening uh, way. So thank you, thank you for sharing both your your thoughts with us and the um, the text itself. And sorry that you uh, the the uh, something went down the wrong way. Um, now I'll introduce someone who I think is known to, to most of you as the convener or one of the conveners of this, um, this session, Francis Negron Montaner, who is an award-winning filmmaker, writer, and scholar, and professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University. She is the editor of several books, including Puerto Rico Jam, Rethinking Nationalism and Colonialism, and None of the Above, Puerto Ricans in the Global Era, and Sovereign Acts. She is director of the Unpayable Debts Working Group of Columbia Center for the Study of Social Difference, which compiled three open access syllabuses on debt regarding Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, and global debts. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Max. Uh, and it was great to hear, Mara. I'm very happy that uh, you are here. So, um, I was asked to talk about Valoricambio, which is a project that I developed as a result of the working group that Max just mentioned. And one of the interesting things about that is that the academic working group actually produced an art project as the best way to um, enable certain types of discussions. So Miguel, would you like to uh, put the um, images up so I can start? It's, it's so much easier to explain with images because the project, um, is quite visual. So the first thing I'd like to say about this project that it truly changed my life and uh, the life of many people who worked in it. Um, the project uh, called Valori Cambio was piloted in Puerto Rico, which as we know by now, uh, has been subject to US colonial capitalist rule since 1898 and incre increased processes of neoliberalization since 2006. Of the many ways that we can describe Valori Cambio, uh, I will choose this one for today, which is a, an interactive experience that combines art, storytelling, and just economy principles to facilitate a conversation of what we call the economy. Uh, its goals are to provide a platform for participants to consider the question of value, experience a non-extractive exchange economy, and introduce the notion of community currency which in the case of our project, we called Personas de Peso Puerto Rico or pesos for short, uh, kind of pun on the double meaning of peso as currency, but also as weight. Um, um, in case you are not familiar with the uh, notion of community currency, uh, one way to define it is a type of non-market money that's created and adopted by groups to value collective skills, knowledge, and talents and facilitate their exchange. In general, community currency don't replace main currencies, but offer ways to strengthen local activity and build economies that are not based on profit and accumulation. So this is 
non-interest bearing um, money. Uh, so you can't accumulate it. Uh, it's not about profit. Uh, around the world, there's about 5,000 community currencies currently uh, circulating. And uh, one of the best known uh, of them are in Latin America. Um, Miguel, let's see a few of those currencies. Um, the need for such a project arose from the intensification of suffering, I would say, in Puerto Rico over the last few years as global capital and US interest devised new mechanisms to extract exorbitant profits from the island. Uh, a brief historical background for those of you not familiar with this, uh, in 2016, a year after the governor of Puerto Rico announced that the island's government amassed a public debt of $72 billion, and that this debt, in addition to 50 billion in pension obligations, was, in his words, impagable or unpayable. Uh, Congress passed the Over, uh, Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, otherwise known uh, cynically as PROMESA. I mean, that's actually the name of the legislation, but it's uh, cynical, which returned Puerto Rico to a direct form of colonial rule. This federal law created a fiscal control board composed of people with deep ties to banking, including entities directly involved in producing debt as a crisis, and granted them broad powers to extract payment by privatization and cuts to all of life's fundamentals, including health, education, infrastructure, infrastructure and pensions. These uh, trends of, of, of suffering and extraction accelerated after September 16, 2017, when a massive hurricane category five named Maria destroyed the archipelago's deteriorated electric and other infrastructure, leaving half a million residents uh, with damage or destroyed homes and an electricity blackout that for many people lasted a year. This also ushered disaster capitalism. Miguel, you should keep going. This also ushered disaster capitalism and a calculated necropolitics by the federal and island governments that resulted in hunger, homelessness, the death of at least 4,645 people, and the migration of another 100,000 residents or 4% of the population to US cities, cities and elsewhere. Poverty rates during this period also soared to near 50% of the population. Such circumstances led me to ask myself questions that as a, mostly a humanities uh, um, scholar I had not considered before. These questions included, what is money? How does it acquire value? Can money be used for disruption? Uh, these questions, however, led me not to an academic article as would normally be the case, uh, but to my first public art project. So to set Valori Cambio in motion, I collaborated with visual artist Sarabel Santos Negron to design an initial series of six banknotes ranging from one to 25 pesos that you see here on the screen. These feature images of Puerto Rican historical figures and an iconic community. Together with a team of designers, computer engineers, and solidarity economy advocates, we reconfigured a donated ATM, which we renamed the VIC, acronym for Valor y Cambio, to record people's stories and dispend the bills. So to obtain a bill in our project, uh, you had to go to the machine, uh, which asked participants to tell us about what they value, how their communities could support what they value, and what people or groups are already sustaining the participants' values. The participants could then exchange the bills for items that partner organizations and businesses. And in this way, Valori Cambio created an economy where the main unit of value was storytelling. So in exchange of the stories that people would tell us about value, they received a bill. And in the reverse of the bill, uh, you had a QR code that with your phone, you can go to online and, and read uh, the story about the person or community that was uh, on it. Uh, and in exchange of the businesses receiving or accepting these bills for the duration of the project, we in turn tell their, told their stories on social media. So starting on February 9 uh, and over the course of eight days, the project visited five locations, two public schools and a youth program. From the first day at the Averdura, which we just saw in Old San Juan, the response to the project really surprised us. 
Hundreds of participants stood in line every day for hours until evening, rain or shine, to obtain a bill. A number of people came every day and others every, every time they could. On the last day of the project, the big was open for 14 hours until midnight to honor the petition of people who worked as cooks, waiters, and bartenders in the area to participate after their shifts had ended. This response immediately begged the question. As the line to obtain the bill was not to access fuel, a job, a concert ticket, other things that would be considered valuable, the most immediate question for us was why? What made this wait worth it? But one thing became immediately clear. It was not for the money. At least it was not for the exchange value of the bills. In a country suffering a profound austerity crisis, the vast majority of people who participated, which in Puerto Rico the first time was more than a thousand, did not spend the money. Of the 1,600 bills that circulated, which totaled thousands of dollars, less than 100 bills totaling 150 pesos were used. That the majority of participants opted to keep the bills may appear as a form of hoarding, but the politics of keeping the money is, I think, a bit more complex. As I engage with participants each day, I heard a lot of reasons for why people kept the money. In some cases, they retained the pesos because the bills represented works of art and both the project and the bills were beautiful. And this was a very used word because the bills also affirmed their identities was another, question, another answer or represented a new beginning. In this regard, we concluded that the bills were a signifier of hope of a more just, inclusive, and equitable Puerto Rico. Another layer to this is that Puerto Rico has never had a national currency, and it's subject to US colonial capitalism, whose symbol is the dollar. In addition, this currency is not only the dollar, not only of another country and a colonial power, it also represents uh, the coloniality of power. Uh, that is the longstanding patterns of power that define culture, labor, intersubjective relations and knowledge production well beyond colonialism in the words of Nelson Baldonado Torres. And this is evident in that the dollar only contains figures of men who identify themselves as white, are representatives of the state and are holders of racist, genocidal and heterosexist policies. In this regard, the idea of a local currency that was created for communal well being and which circulates images and stories of women, Blacks, Puerto Ricans, migrants, children of immigrants, writers, doctors, educators, athletes, thinkers, feminists, union organizers, individuals, but also families and communities, disrupted the ways that Puerto Ricans are discounted daily by the US currently currency, including politically, economically, and culturally. So to rejoice at the currency was then to challenge multiple la layers of dispossession. The peso in that sense was not was only beautiful, but literally a piece of each participant's personal and collective history that people really did not want to part with or transact with. The project also surprised us in another way. It brought tremendous joy. And it yielded a new concept to consider the role of joy in politics, which I called the colonial joy. Day after day, I noticed that joy generally happened when participants received the bills, particularly when they received the figure or the bill that they hoped for. And one of the most memorable examples of that process was that of a young artist and teacher, Eduardo Paz, who made the line for hours, so for several days, because he wanted to receive one particular bill, the number one, featuring the Cordero siblings. And when he finally did receive it on the last day of the tour on February 18, I asked him why this bill brought him so much joy. And he said, basically, the bill represents who I am, an Afro-descendant man fighting, educating, and showing his roots through the different situations that life can present. It is worth a lot. I, I must say that at times before I st studied it closely, uh, I distrusted this joy. I mean, and mine included, as I enjoyed working on this project. 
all joy is not good or means good. Uh, some may rejoice at another's misfortune or take pleasure in it. Yet during Valori Cambio, I feel that joy appeared at the moment when many, myself included, felt, I, this is the emotional component of, the, of it, the possibility of a different now, one where neither colonialism nor coloniality ruled over our lives. And in this sense is what I found uh, joy to be political. As scholar Miroslav Bols has noted, joy sets itself tacitly against features of the world over which we cannot or should not rejoice. So, which is perhaps why this joy has been contagious, leading to another unexpected outcome of the project, which was the immediate emergence of community currencies and solidarity projects. It was one of our goals that we wanted to introduce the idea of community currency in case people felt that they had a use for it. Uh, but the response was pretty much immediate. The first community to do it was El Caño Martin Peña. Uh, a month before the big touch the ground, I had visited El Caño to ask permission to tell their story in our 25 peso bill. And after a brief conversation, they proposed that we bring the project to the community's farmer market. And then we went there as part of the tour. And shortly after, a few months after, on October, El Caño launched its Tienda Solidaria and Puerto Rico's first community currency uh, that's not part of an art project like ours. It's called the Pasos of El, El Caño Martin Peña. And it was named the Pasos because um, it's given to people that contribute to the community uh, to recognize that contribution. And the Pasos is because they bring the community closer to its goal. It's a step further in the direction of meeting their goals. A second project that should be launched as soon is that of Just Exchange in New York. Uh, the project eventually traveled to New York and it was in the Lower East Side for some time and later in El Barrio. Um, and of course, you know, not everything that happened during our project was joyful. Uh, the fact that our project was greeted with joy is directly related to the sufferings of austerity, the aftermath of Maria and mass migration. In fact, one of the things that I elaborate in the essay, Decolonial Joy, is precisely how uh, this type of joy and um, which is quite different from other conceptions of happiness uh, that have been criticized by Sarah Med and other people, um, you know, is deeply linked to experiences of suffering. Um, I also noticed that um, while joy was widely shared and collectively experienced, what made people joyful was often different. And you can anticipate that on an actual political terrain, these different forms of joy might not necessarily cohere. Uh, for instance, a small number of people who participated in the project did so with the main objective of cashing in on the colonial joy. So in less than 48 hours of the project being on the ground, at least two people were selling the pesos on eBay for as much as $125. Dollars, <laughs> And this led to intense arguments, uh, both uh, uh, in our, our project, uh, uh, in, not in our project, but in our, on the ground uh, when we were uh, going around, uh, and also online. Joy was likewise not the only response to Valori Cambio. Comments in relation to the two most visible press and broadcast items on the project showed that many people did not experience the colonial joy, but colonial capitalists discussed at our project. Of the more than 400 comments that were left uh, in El Nuevo Día and Telemundo's website on their Valori Cambio coverage, the overwhelming majority were insults to the artist, mockery of the ideas that Puerto Ricans could ever have a valuable currency or have a thriving economy without the US. Yet, um, although questions and challenges remain both about the notion of the colonial joy, it's um, actual practice uh, in a political terrain uh, and subsequent experiences in New York and elsewhere. I feel that for some of us um, that participated and felt this joy, all that we have wanted to do ever since has been to create um, context to pass it on and on. Um, so with that, I leave you and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Francis.
uh, I love this project so much. It's so inspiring. Um, and having having done a lot of research in the past myself about the way in which artists use money or money like objects in their work, this is really has always been one of my favorite projects. So I always love hearing about it. Um, I want to encourage those of you who are in the uh, panel room with us, if you want to ask a question coming up, um, to raise your hand and I'll, I'll call on you. And for those who are attendees to use the Q&A box or the chat box to place your questions, which I can then pass on to the uh, panelists. And if you want to ask the question yourself and you're an attendee, uh, also, please type that into the chat box, and I believe uh, Miguel can promote you to being also a panelist, and then you can appear with us here in as close to a live setting as we're going to get for the next few months, unfortunately. Um, I thought maybe I would kick things off by um, asking a question about, about the imagination, and it was inspired a bit, uh, uh, Mara, by your... Um, the, the the way in which you you drew out this strange slip the slip of spelling between majesty and majesty or majesty from the the spanish uh the king who on his visit and i was thinking about the way that at, at least in english uh but also going back to their greek and latin roots if you pronounce majesty with a g rather than a j you get something that sounds a lot more like magic um, and if you pronounce it with a J, you get something that sounds a lot more like power. And it it brought to mind again the the strange the strange power that the strange kind of almost magical power that we're dealing with when we talk about debt, which is that ultimately this thing we call debt cannot be seen, it can't be grasped, it can't be held, and yet it has such incredible power over whole societies, whole populations based in to some extent on the incredible power it has over the imagination um now that imagination is of course backed up by armies backed up by laws and courts backed up by policies but i suppose i wanted to um begin there by then coming back to you both and asking in a situation where we are ruled by this strange structure of the imagination this magic majesty or or uh, majestic magic, like what is the role then for the poet and for the artist in that moment? Uh, the the kind of the person who has, by dint of the way we've organized our society, been tasked with or accepted the responsibility for working with the imagination. Um, how do you how do you see that that role changing in this moment of struggle, both for Puerto Rican? Um, uh liberation but also sort of more generally in a world now defined increasingly by debts well um i don't know how to answer i don't know if the question was for both of us for francis mm -hmm. and i um um yeah but i um i don't know if francis want to say something about it maybe i can think a little bit more about if the question I can say a few things uh one is that the re one of the reasons that uh the working group on debt in puerto rico ended up uh, creating a art project had to do with um some conversations that we had with activists mm. and we were proposing to hold some kind of assembly and we're talking about 2018 so it's like several years before the assemblies actually happened uh, as a result of the um the summer um campaign to oust um ricky rosselló mm. and they told us that uh they didn't want to go to another assembly <laughs> that they didn't want to go to another meeting, that they felt they were stretched and exhausted uh, precisely for some of the conditions that Mara, you were explaining earlier. Uh, and that seemed uh, dispiriting for a moment. It's like, oh, the, people don't really want to come together. People don't want to um, um, coordinate so political power could be uh, expanded and deepened. Um, so what, what does that mean? And, and I think that question was when we came, well, perhaps we need to 
uh, create an environment where people want to participate that doesn't feel like they're doing this other type of work. Um, and in that process, uh, experience, uh, what would it feel to be in a non-extractive economy? Uh, what would it be like if we had another conception of money? What would it be like if uh, sharing stories got, you know, um, guaranteed your well-being? <laughs> you know, so it was a, a way of imagining, not only imagining, because we, we created the conditions to have an experience if you wanted to participate, um, materialize it. And, and I, I think another moment where I felt very strongly that uh, the imagination was reshaping, even in, in small ways, uh, what was happening, uh, is the first time that uh, a business put up the poster set, que decía, se aceptan pesos, we accept pesos. Uh, on their front, uh, I was there and uh, people started stopping. What is that? Pesos, there's a Puerto Rico currency, what's going on? And they would come in and then they would ask for a beer and they would ask to keep talking about it. Uh, so it, it, it showed how imagining or materializing something that didn't exist or people thought was impossible um, actually triggered, all, had all kinds of effects, right? Um, now, as, as Alves, uh, um, the Brazilian poet that I quote in the Colonia Joy, it's like sometimes you put the seed in the ground and you will not see its fruit. So I don't know where this is going. Uh, if anywhere, uh, um, you know, that I cannot tell. But what I witnessed was that uh, even materializing something that people thought impossible that required imagination because it's not a given in the environment. Uh, the second uh, um, instance that I'd like to refer to is that before uh, cohering the project, I curated uh, an exhibit at Columbia called uh, Puerto Rico Underwater, uh, which took its title uh, in part from Adal Maldonado's um, Puerto Ricans Underwater phot Photography Series. And uh, there, there were five artists that were featured. And one of the things that really caught my attention from curating that show uh, was the ways that artists were accessing dimensions of the debt crisis that was not present in either scholarly discourse or certainly not uh, uh, laws or policies or other types of discourse, which included the surrealness of it, which included uh, the affect of anger, feeling drowned, um, uh, which included how to reframe or how to see uh, what we could call the debris of the debt crisis. Like in Sarabel, that's what attracted me to Sarabel Santos's work in that um, in that project, which she was chronicling all these objects uh, that were in our environment, but inviting us to look at them. Uh, in relation to the debt crisis and not simply as garbage, let's say. Um, so I think in all those ways, it seemed compelling to me to think that artistic practices of various different kinds um, are where, you know, modes of inquiry, ways of asking questions and, um, and coherent communities and, um, and thinking about other uh, alternatives. Okay, adding, um, thank you, Francis. Um, listening to Francis, I, I sort of, um, I thought about the practices of different friends I have in Puerto Rico and on my own and things on ways in which we have um, used our imagination to be able to be here. And something is that, um, Many of us have left the capital, um, are not in San Juan anymore, as me and as my friend Nicole Delgado, who moved to Isabela. So um, I think that this moment has um, allowed us, in a way, to reinvent uh, uh, from where we are going to uh, write or from where we are going to, to talk. And for me, uh, when I returned, I never imagined me moving to Ponce. I'm from San Juan and I was raised and born in, in San Juan. And it was uh, something that I, uh, something that happened because of the job opportunities in Puerto Rico right now. Um, but I'm a Caribbeanist. I, I, 
I write about the Caribbean and I discovered that you, it was the first time I was actually living next to the Caribbean because in the north of the island we, had, um, we, we look at the Atlantic. And uh, I have learned so much about um, the ecological violence of the south of Puerto Rico and about the ways in which uh, the mutual aid practices um, uh, develop here in communities. And, um, and one of the things I did is that I also moved to the countryside of Ponce, which is very close to Adjuntas, uh, as you said in the, in the biography. And um, I'm trying to work from my own neighborhood. Uh, right now I'm teaching a workshop um, that it's, uh, the, the students are women from my neighborhood that are farmers or, or that, I, that are in the neighborhood and um, that have no experience or have never been in a poetry workshop. And there we are writing we are, we are doing some of, of sort of a ethnographic um, workshop in which we are writing um, these botanical notebooks that were written by Ana Roque de Dupre and were never published. And we are writing um, different kinds of text and poems uh, from there, you know, inspired or as a conversation with that what that book that was never published and in a way you know i think that um, my my um my desire is to to pay a debt we have also with people like ana roque de dupre who is this very important um writer and and unknown in out, uh, outside Puerto Rico in many ways. And also to bring ways of using imag imagination in, to people who are, who are maybe have never been exposed to uh, some e experiments or some techniques of some discourses, uh, right? So it's a very beautiful experience. And I think that uh, yeah, it's the way in which I think about imagination right now. Thank you. Um, just another encouragement for folks to jump in or raise their hand or if, or put in the Q&A if you want. Um, if there's time, I want to come back to uh, where, where you concluded there, Mara, with this question about like the other subterranean debts that are underneath the surface uh, that we don't speak about, the debts to each other, the debts to history. Um, but I wanted to make a quick note to say that one of the things that I, I really felt I heard in both of your responses was something that I've also heard from many artists working in many places where uh, unpayable debts uh, and politics of debt have been imposed, which is that artists seem to increasingly be uh, not necessarily moving away from publishing and galleries and kind of the, the conventional uh, forums for sharing art, but are also integrating in very fascinating ways uh, into the communities that they find themselves in. And, and thinking about the way that the artist can be a kind of catalyst for inventing new ways of being together, new economies, new uh, practices uh, that can exist in spite of the, the debts that are being imposed. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's really fascinating to observe this, this trend and very inspiring. Um, and I was thinking about you opening, Mara, with uh, Aimé Césaire, who, whose politics were kind of more um, traditional, uh, sort of um, socialist politics, uh, of course, a major contributor to the Negritude movement and anti-colonial movements, but one, you know, eventually Césaire himself became a kind of conventional politician and was elected to government. And his vision of how things changed was to a certain extent top down um, perhaps. Whereas the forms of change that you're both speaking to feel like they come more from the bottom up from transforming the nature of the way in which people understand their um, their relationship to one another and to community. D do you think that's a fair assessment? And do you see other artists doing something similar as well at this moment? 
in these kind of debt debt encumbered spaces? But the question for both. Um, well, I, I say two things about that uh, to start. Uh, one is that a lot, uh, you know, in in the process of researching community currency projects, mm. and to some extent, I was in in conversation with you about this. Uh, one quickly sees that uh, m a lot of them are started by artists. <laughs> so, so historically, that correlation uh, is is not hard to uh, verify, right? And then one might ask. Why? I mean, what is it about the precarity of artists, perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, or the forms of work? Like, if I think uh, before Valori Cambio, most of my work was um, in film, which is a collective. Um, in general, you you do films in a collective fashion, right? And although in some sets it's hard, very hierarchical, not so much in mine. Um, you know, you do work with other people and you do have to um, learn how to create a common goal and direct yourself. Um, the second thing uh, I would say is that, I'm, and I'm writing about this now, so I don't have um, the conclusion quite yet, but I would, I would stretch what you've said to say that, um, that it also includes a very central dimension of infrastructure. Like I, what I've seen in Puerto Rico over the last decade or so is that not only have artists uh, become more interested or more rooted, and we can use different words to describe it, uh, in community-based projects or, or relations, uh, engagement, uh, but also that the arts have become part of, of larger projects of um, materializing different forms of infrastructure that includes uh, not only like literal infrastructure like solar power, um, but also uh, and physical like um, taking over a space and converting it into something else, but also what we could call emotional or psychic infrastructures, right? Or, or, or producing new subjectivities which I feel is one of the things that Valerie Cambio allowed me to do and to witness uh, different from a film. You know, you see a film fly on the screen or maybe you see it at home. But in the case of Valerie Cambio, it was almost like a, uh, it was a space where we could see, like we could try out, you know, what would it be to relate to each other in this other way? And, and how does that feel? And so, so I, I also think that it was not, it's not only physical infrastructure, um, but also emotional and psychic, for to put it somehow. Maybe, Amara, do you do you have a response to that, or? Well, I I was just thinking about. Um, that I this during this weekend I went to this um, a trueque market and now that I I I, I knew about Frances a project and I actually wanted to have to that <laughs> the colonial joy <laughs> but it I don't know if you were able I think because of your talk uh, the project didn't go to Ponce but it, it, it I think it would be amazing to have it here <laughs> but um there's a um, uh Huerto Urbano a uh, urban um como diría un, um, garden that was um started after Maria in the middle of Ponce in the middle of downtown Ponce. And um, that it has started to, to give a lot of workshops on Trueque economy. And I think that it's something that uh, it's happening around the island too that, uh, uh, and I think it's not casual that you have uh, Luisa Capetillo in one of the bills, right? And I think that there are many ways in which um, I think that the mutual aid idea of anarchism is taking place in, in grassroots community projects. And uh, for me, it's a way of revisiting her and revisit, revisiting um, anarchism in the Caribbean uh, as a way of finding ways of, of uh, getting out of debt, of the debt mentality. Okay, because it's not the same, I, I'm in debt, you know, I have many debts, but I can live without the debt mentality if I train and if I, if I learn uh, herramientas, tools to do so. 
And I think that many people is looking for those tools for ways of practicing and, and com getting in community uh, that are um, trying to get them out of the neoliberal and um, neocolonial um, mindset, right? So yes, I'm just going to, I, I thought about that. I have a question for Mara, maybe for people that are uh, attending that might also have thought about this. One of my, one of the hypotheses that I'm trying to uh, figure out is whether, do you think that part of the reason, not the only one certainly, but uh, could one of the reasons of this shift in the ways that artists are working or that it has extended, there's always been artists working this way, but has become more generalized does that have something to do with the cuts of state patronage to the arts uh, or the, 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 the shifting relationship between artists and the state? I wonder whether, I mean, there's certainly arts that almost never get any support from the state vis-a-vis uh, -vis others, right? But and we're talking about a moment where, uh, you know, these cultural institutions that are funded by the state have been heavily hit by uh, austerity um, so I just wonder if you had any thoughts about that uh, or anyone in the uh, attending uh, participating today, because I, um, I'm following that thread a little bit, see where it goes. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Yes, definitely. Um, well, um, in terms of publishing, that, that has been always a problem. Uh, the Instituto de Cultura publisher was um, eh, desmontado eh, hace muy poco tiempo recently. And eh, all the work that, for example, the editor Angel Antonio did some years ago, republishing and, and, and recovering eh, the project of, of poesía, eh, of, of the, a series of poetry books that uh, for young writers uh, was complete was finished you know like we uh, and it was the first time in my generation that I I uh, that we were all seeing the Instituto de Cultura publishing young poets and it was for a very little time like five or six years and um with Pedro Rosselló, with um, Ricardo Rosselló as a governor that was um, stopped. And um, as you said, in Puerto Rico, we have had very little uh, support from the state in arts. And there's definitely that has an impact on the ways that people try to uh, create a practice. Um, but it has been for so many generations already that I cannot like recall a generation that had different, um, like a different relationship to the state. Uh, although maybe thinking about the, the, the 60s or 70s in, in terms of publishing in the Instituto de Cultura. Um, but yeah, I think that definitely not having the support of the state or not even like an organized, um, a project of, of uh, giving visibility to Puerto Rican literature has um, has have like it is something that has done a lot on on the ways in which uh, we decide to publish or we de we decide to to write or where do we publish so encouraging for example uh, many uh, handcrafted publishers. There's a lot of, there's a big movement in Puerto Rico of uh, uh, autopublicarse and doing like uh, ediciones artesanales with uh, cardboard or in ways that are going against the idea of, of progress in technology as for example is Nicole that is Nicole and Amanda that are uh, publishing with Risograph with uh, risografia. So instead of, of finding, you know, the most advanced technological, technological ways of printing, they are going backwards to recovering risographs and doing um, different moves. So, and that is something that probably will have not been um, possible in, a, in an official publisher from the state doing that kind of, of work. Um, 
that has also a uh, aesthetic uh, uh, standpoint. So yeah. And it relates to the question of infrastructure or uh, different types of infrastructures that can be maintained. Like for instance, in, in our project, one of the early obstacles was how, where are we going to get an ATM? <laughs> Uh, I mean, it was super expensive. We, we we couldn't build it from scratch, and we ended up recycling one, which was the, the most logical thing to do, uh, and using very uh, low tech, um, you know, options uh, and affordable materials uh, in order to create our storytelling bank. Let's say, um, and actually rejecting other options that would have been potentially easier on us, but that represented other types of uh, social relations and, and relations with capital and infrastructure that didn't want to reproduce. So that makes a lot of sense. We have a question from Miguel in a second, but I also I sort of picking up on what you were saying, uh, Francis, I think my discussions with young visual artists um, that I've met in, very, in my studies around the world is also that many of them are trying to refuse becoming an infrastructure of capital. I think there's a lot of concern over the way that artists have been leveraged as these kind of uh, what got called the shock troops of gentrification. And also this way that there's a kind of weird way that uh, whole economic zones are trying to kind of embrace some strange notion of the kind of globalization through a strange embrace of the arts. So I think that's part of also the, as well as the removal of state funding, there's also this move away from the forms of complicity that have been forced on artists too. Uh, Miguel, I see that you have some, uh, you have some questions you'd like to ask. Yes, so thank you so much for sharing this amazing work and really inspiring. Um, and I, I had a couple of questions, but one of them was already answered. Um, but in regards to the sharing of the visual archive and, and the poetry reading, Mara, I was really, uh, um, I was really captured by the powerful line of Deuda Tendré. So and that I will have, and since we were talking from the start in this series on how to visualize that and develop as um, uh, Lucia and Veronica were, were telling, uh, feminist uh, economies of disobedience, how this line for me it sounded a very powerful statement of deuda tendré. So that I will have, but I will own this debt and I can make something out of this owning that that is placed onto me as an unconditional uh, condition and i just was just thinking how this exercise of writing uh, and educating at the same time is helping you i'm curious if you are developing um some kind of workshops or writing workshops with students and how students are uh, or how writing poetry is helping students to make themselves uh, part of this debt, but also not part of the debt, but part of this dismantling of debt that comes as a part of this condition of owning debt. Is it, is it possible to own debt, to uh, this in debt oneself with others? This was one, one curiosity. And if I can, if we have the time for Francis, I was very interested in how memory uh, work as a mobilizer in your project, uh, for instance, with the, with the bill of the Cordero sisters, um, so I'm curious uh, to know if uh, whether the storytelling that you got and, and the storytelling archive that it was produced uh, out of this project um, showed some kind of intergenerational connection to other movements tackling that uh, in other decades or how people uh, experience that beforehand or any kind of tradition uh, contracting depth before the project uh, from, I don't know, other generations. Mara, you want to start? I'm, I'm also curious to see what happens in the workshops uh, in terms of, of uh, creating, you know, different subjectivities around debt. Um, thank you for the question, Miguel. Uh, so something that happens, at least in Puerto Rico, in terms of community, there's a lot of people with the desire of community but sometimes, uh, as Francis was also saying, there's no infrastructure or there are no culture of uh, 
getting into community to practice those arts. Uh, let, let me explain, for example, when I moved to Ponce, although there was a lot of interest in, in young people in poetry, there, uh, uh, I guess that at some point there was a culture of poetry readings, but there were no spaces or there, there was not a tradition uh, that I was able to follow. Uh, however, I learned that the first house that I moved in downtown Ponce used to be the first book club in, in Ponce during 19th century. And inspired by that, or, and also by the desire of community, I started um, organizing these poetry readings in the farmer's market in downtown Ponce. That uh, is also, it used to be on Saturdays. Uh, we don't have it anymore with the with the pandemic, um, but hope, hopefully it's going to be reopened at some point. And there we started uh, doing poetry readings with different topics each week and um, uh, asking students and people from town to write poems with those topics. And um, I remember that at some point one weekend, the topic was deuda. But you know, uh, we were chosen also. We were chosen chosen also the topics with a uh, with a bag, and we will put all the topics that people wanted and taking one from them, and and that was the topic for the next week. And I remember many poems of uh, suffering, as as Frances said, of people talking about how that was impacting their lives and how uh, how they experiment depth in their. In, 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 in everyday life, right? Um, and in, in the university I teach, um, we have a poetry group, um, a student poetry group in which they are, they actually did a, a publication with all their poems, a, a crafted, a handcrafted publication. Um, and they, are definitely, I think that uh, I've been lucky because they are very receptive to and to these new experience experiences. And also we have one bookstore <laughs> in town that is El Candil. And they have also been very supportive of my ideas of doing poetry readings and activities. And definitely it's a way of um, getting out all this repressed feelings and understanding by listening to each other, how the different experience, what the different experiences have in common. And, um, and I know, well, uh, Katia Chico, that is a friend of mine, that she's a professor also uh, in Ponce. I know that also not just in my university, but the University of Puerto Rico in Ponce uh, uh, is very active on, on doing poetry readings and poetry workshops, workshops for students. And my friend Marta Jasmin, uh, who is also a professor at the University of Puerto Rico in Ponce. So um, I cannot recall right now specific poems about, but I remember uh, um, that, that the poems were a way in which a lot of people started uh, telling their stories. Um, and yeah, so. Uh, first, I, before I forget, I should say that um, the first tour of Valori Cambio, we only got, uh, got outside of San Juan once. We went to Macao, to Punta Santiago. Uh, and we had the goal of returning a second tour and going to Ponce and elsewhere. But then the 3000 earthquakes came uh, and that severely affected that region. And then uh, COVID. So the, the project is back in Puerto Rico. It, uh, it's in El Museo de Arte Contemporáneo and it might stay in Puerto Rico for a little bit. Uh, so that goal to go outside of the metro area is still uh, viable or possible. To Miguel's question, um, I should say that one of the explicit goals of selecting these particular figures was that they allowed us to uh, recall and connect traditions, intellectual activists, and other political traditions that we felt uh, were um, current that we could use. Um, so indeed, part of our intent 
was for people to uh, read about uh, these stories, relate them and situate them because the, the types of politics represented in all the bills are very different. So for instance, if you think about the Cordero siblings, uh, they're practiced like a black uh, Christian liberation theology for education. Uh, whereas um, we mentioned Luisa Capetillo as a, a feminist anarchist or anarchist feminist. Um, and then you have someone like Roberto Clemente practicing a certain kind of humanitarian um, uh, use of celebrity. So th these are, or Caño Martin Peña, uh, you know, very different politics. So, so one of the things we wanted to, to say is that we've had a very long trajectory of multiple forms of politics addressing some of the most challenging questions and circumstances that we're confronting now. And, and I think that type of project um, gains certain um, importance when not only are the uh, cultural institutions, uh, Instituto de Cultura and so forth being dismantled, but also the archives, like one of the latest uh, uh, rounds of cuts are directly affecting the uh, national archives in Puerto Rico. <laughs> So, so we have to invent and we have to create infrastructure and we have to also uh, maintain a certain kind of archival memory that links past, present and, and future or, or you know, things about those three dimensions uh, as part of the epistemological project of um, surviving uh, coloniality, colonialism, coloniality and racial capitalism right now, right? have a handful of minutes in case anyone has some final questions or some final thoughts they want to share um, from our audiences. Um, I'll just uh, perhaps say that I, one of the things that I really valued about uh, what I've learned here today is uh, to come back to the theme of education, that's the kind of umbrella for, for this whole series, is how interestingly both of your practices and the art, other art uh, work that you're pointing to um, does a kind of educational work, but not simply about sort of sharing facts, but also kind of awakening conversations where a kind of collective form of education can take place. And that's, I think, really inspiring and, and gives us a lot of reason to hope uh, for uh, that, that something interesting will emerge from under the shadow of debt, um, that some interesting different forms of life can thrive in that area, even as they battle against it. And I'm seeing in the, in the chat that many people would like to hear some more poems. If Mara, you would be willing to share some with us. Yeah, closing point would be great. And just to say, Max, that I think those other forms are already emerged or some mm -hmm. of them have already so, so it's not in the future i think it's happening mm -hmm. <laughs> uh right now now where is it going that's a different question <laughs> but that there's definitely uh, a complex vibrancy happening i i think that's the case mara last word well thank you so much and thank you for asking for more poems and thank you for francis uh, for inviting me and to all of you um, well, there are two more poems in the selection that I sent, I sent you, Max. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I can read those two. Uh, one of them is the one that is titled, uh, that one, False Ice Cream Shop. And um, in a way, it's also referring to debt and the debt uh, in my family household. Ella me pidió una máquina para hacer helado. Cuando lo dijo, las clavículas pronunciadas empezaban a marchitarse, pero su piel era la carne misma del coco. Quería una máquina para hacer helado, venderlos en la urbanización y así pagar el mantenimiento de las casas que ya no habita. Nada importó haber regresado de una ciudad en posguerra, remodelar los interiores de un pasado otomano. Nada importó. No había trabajo en esta isla. No importa haberlo hecho todo bien, dice su cuerpo. Yo quisiera decirle, la máquina de hacer helado lo arreglará todo. And uh, the last poem to paint a house, uh, that poem um, 
it's here. Para pintar una casa hay que trabajar horas extra, eliminar primero las plagas, lijar las ventanas, poner prioridades, el techo con guano, el desprendimiento de tierra, las cucarachas, la humedad en las paredes. Para pintar una casa, es decir, recubrir de pintura las paredes que sostienen el sueño de los cuerpos. Ver de un color distinto el lugar donde te desvelas, cocinas, duermes, las camas donde duermen los nombres, las, las almohadas. Hay que hacer sacrificios para pintar la casa. Hay que tener varios trabajos, preparar disciplinadamente el almuerzo de la semana, encontrar mucho tiempo en donde ya no queda. No ir a las bodas elegantes de las primas, repetirse, ¿por qué no pedir un préstamo? Mientras observo la pared descascarillada agotarse, posponer mensualmente la tarea. Para pintar una casa o contar las estrías que le deja la tierra cuando tiembla y que habrá que recubrir, enderezar, decidir que no hay que pintar la casa, no pintarla nunca, esperar que el salitre le quite lo que queda como el esmalte a las uñas, no pensar ya en pintarla, quitarle a la noche esos segundos de desvelo, dárselos a otro sueño. ¿Acaso unos hierros que refuercen la cuna de la niña? Dejar las puertas abiertas para si hubiera que salir de la casa despintada. Ok, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I noticed that I was reading another version and not the same version of the English poem. <laughs> well, the book coming out soon, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the book and, and the translations are, as, as Max said, by Maria Jose Jimenez and Anna Rosenwald. So, thank you. Thank you for sharing that wonderful work. And I just want to relate all of the praise and enthusiasm from the, uh, the chat as well. I believe that uh, brings us to the end of our, at the end of our time. So uh, perhaps I'll pass it back to Miguel and, and Francis to close the series. Yes, well, thank you so much. This, as, as we said, with this last series, we will be posting the recordings of all the sessions that we have had. Uh, and it's also the closing uh, of the working group, uh, except for one more project that we will be doing, which is mapping debt throughout Latin America, which we will be working on over the summer. Um, so thank you everyone for participating. Uh, I don't know, Jason joined us as well as the coordinator or uh, co-coordinator of the uh, and convener of the series, Jason. Thank you to everyone. Uh, mil gracias, I learned a ton and uh, there's a lot of work to do. So thank you so much, everyone. Miguel? Yes, to, to thank you again for everything. I learned a lot and I really hope people could watch this series because it is as urgent as uh, exciting. And thanks again and, and good luck also with the, the rest of the project and on the mapping. I hope that it can be delivered so that we can also collectively think in other fields and areas about debt and debt resistance. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Max, uh, Miguel and Max. And uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be talking. <laughs>